we've actually done something like this and had a panel of veterans. So I appreciate you being willing to share your time here uh, with us and uh, you know everybody who's here, folks who are here, and anybody who happens to want to be able to get some benefit from it. My name is Leroy Johnson. I'm the chair of counseling. I'm also a veteran. I guess we'll read through the bios a little bit after you guys. I started my 73 and ended in 94, you know, and they put up a big sign saying it was safe. Yeah, that's when I showed up, so you guys know. Or, so, but it's really great to have you here to, to talk about some of the things that you've experienced. Um, and we've got a, a order, I'll, I'll just kind of go through our order of, uh, of uh, how we have your bios written. So, uh, Dick, you can go a little bit, thank you. So, uh, from Minneapolis, Minneapolis uh, Lieutenant Commander Richard Engel graduated from the Naval Academy with the class of 1959. He reported for flight training. He is a U.S. Navy pilot who flew the A-6 Intruder, all weather attack aircraft. He had received 19 Air Medals and three Distinguished Flying Cross Medals for his 183 missions in the Vietnam War. In nine months duty from May 1972, 1973, while stationed aboard the USS Saratoga, Saratoga CVA 60, Flying A 6A crew. Um, next will be Herbert Johnson. Oh. Yes. Which I think I have a skip. Name here for you. Uh, from Brooklyn, New York, Herbert, known as Skip, enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1960 and retired in 1983. Skip was stationed in Puerto Rico during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. He served aboard the USS Enterprise from 1963 through 1965 and aboard the USS Midway from 1969 through 1973 and was on board during Vietnam combat operations. Chief in the Navy, Skip was ABF, Aviation Postman's Skip. Our third one is Carlos, Carlos Hernandez. Carlos from San Diego, California. Carlos was drafted into the U.S. Army in June 1969 and served until March 1971. Carlos served in the 173rd Airborne Brigade, also known as Westmoreland's Fire Brigade, and the Herd 173rd, from April 1970 to March 1971. The 173rd Airborne Brigade has the distinction of being the only unit that jumped in Vietnam. And Carlos received parachute wings and a combat infantry badge for his service. Last is Charlie, but not least. <laughs> Charlie. Bouchain? Bouchain, exactly. From North Andover, Maryland, um, Captain Charles Bouchain graduated from Salem State College in Salem, Massachusetts, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and was commissioned from Aviation Officer Candidate School in NAS Pensacola, Florida, in 1968. In January 1971, Charlie reported for duty to VA 128. Naval Air Station Whippy Island, Washington, where he completed fleet replacement training in the A6A intruder, all weather air attack aircraft. Signed to the attack squadron 52, Charlie deployed to Tonkin Gulf aboard the USS Kitty Hawk CBA 63, from which he flew over 200 combat missions against North Vietnam. He is a decorated Vietnam War veteran who has received two distinguished flying crosses, among many other medals, awards, and commendations. I'd like to thank you all again for being here and being willing to share with us uh, in this veterans week activity. Thank you. So we've got our four panelists and we have some folks here, at least somebody taking some good notes, I appreciate that. Um, and what I'd like to do is be able to, one, allow the panelists first to talk individually about anything you'd like to say that you feel you want to say. We are just glad to have you here and be able to, you know, uh, tap into your expertise. And then we'll open it up to questions from the folks in the audience. So I'll start with the panelists. Whoever would like to go first. Um, I'm going to probably use this map in a minute or two, but okay. the thing about the Vietnam War that I think is relevant from, this is all my own opinion, is that um, we had a domino theory in the U.S and that was that communism was going to slowly but surely spread throughout Southeast Asia and eventually get to all the countries there and maybe even get down to some westernized 
countries like Singapore and Australia. I think it was a pretty flawed assumption looking back on it now because um, we just thought that that form of government and socialism was an equivalent to what we had here in terms of democracy and capitalism. But we wanted to draw the line in the sand with Vietnam and stop the so-called bracket creep with regard to the spread of socialism. And you had North Vietnam, North Vietnam that was um, <clears throat> communist, and you had South Vietnam that was backed by the US uh, trying to be a democracy. Um, the surrogates were for the North were Russia and China, and we are obviously were the backers of South, South, South Vietnam. And at that time, North Vietnam was trying to convert or invade or change that philosophy of government in the South. And that's how we got involved in it. I remember distinctly in 1965 watching the Marines go ashore and the Army go ashore and thinking, well, this will be over in about 15 minutes because we really know what we're doing and these are a bunch of irregular guerrillas. Obviously, that wasn't the case. Um, our strategy was fairly flawed in that from the air perspective, at least, what we were attempting to do is interdict, interdict the uh, supply chain going into South Vietnam. If they don't have supplies, uh, uh, munitions, food, water, et cetera, et cetera, to prosecute the war, then, then that particular group down there is going to wither on the vine and die. Uh, and we never were willing to prosecute that the way it needed to be done, in my opinion. So the supply chain never was broken. And I'll, just point that out on the map and then I'll shut up because I tend to dominate things. <laughs> so what you have up here is you've got China supplying North Vietnam with, with everything they need to fight the war. And North Vietnam then bringing it down through Laos, what's called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and supplying South Vietnam guerrillas. Um, in addition, you can see Haiphong Harbor up there and the Soviet Union, backed by the Warsaw Pact, was bringing tons and tons of shipping in there every month to resupply also. And we were unwilling, because we didn't want to start World War III, or the potential for that, to cut the supply lines via air power from China to North Vietnam or to mine Haiphong Harbor. Now, that changed in 1972 when President Nixon got pretty frustrated with this whole thing, and we were allowed, A6s primarily were allowed to mine High Farm Harbor and shut that thing down. The frustrating thing for me in getting involved in the war at the right age of 24 was day after day going into Laos and bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and we were literally 250 miles from the anthill. All we had down there was a couple ants. Does that make any sense? So we were so far decentralized from where all the supplies were that this Ho Chi Minh trail bombing that we did for years and years was not that effective. With that, I'll pass it over to <laughs> another A6 guy. I was flying the A6 basically at the end of the war, and I can confirm everything that Charlie just said. We didn't, nobody asked me whether I liked the war. It wasn't a case of liking the war. I was trained to go do what the government, and this was the war that was going on, and I was trained to go do it. I didn't give a second thought to what was going on. I did what I was told. My targets were largely the surface-to-air sites in North Vietnam. My only missions in South Vietnam were the first month we were there. They would send us in, and we would contact an Air Force forward air controller, Generally, it was always covered with clouds, and we would roll in on some target that he designated on the ground and drop our bombs on that target, and he would come back after we dropped all of our bombs and say how effective we were. And generally, he always said we were very effective. We really never knew what, what went on on the ground. Uh, went back to the ship uh, after that month. The la that's the last we saw of South Vietnam, unless we were coming and going 
when the ship would return to Cubie Point in the Philippines for maybe a week, give us a break of what's going on, and then we'd come back. We generally worked 12 hours a day. We worked from midnight to 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, and then the next week we would work from 8 o'clock in the morning till midnight. And then we would have another one-day break, and then we would work from, uh, I'm sorry, from noon to midnight. Uh, we would fly daytime strikes, which amounted to a different type of attack, and we would fly from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. And those were strictly daytime attacks. But the rest of the time, I was on single mission attacks, uh, flying over North Vietnam, flying at 600 feet because the SAMs couldn't get me. In the nine months I was there, I don't remember seeing a SAM because the SAMs had to go up to 1,000 feet before they armed, and then they couldn't come back down to get me. So I felt pretty safe at night flying at 600 feet. Uh, over North Vietnam, and generally in the flat areas around Hai, uh, Hanoi and Haiphong Harbor. We did mine the Hang uh, Haiphong Harbor pretty heavily. I would go in with four A6s and maybe a couple even a couple of A7s loaded with mostly 500-pound bombs with a mine type of fusing on it. So it was just a 500-pound dummy bomb that I'd been dropping all the time, but I had a fuse on it that would count ships and so we locked up Haiphong Harbor. The whole time we were there, we would replenish it. We wouldn't know how long the bombs would last because we knew they had a definite 30-day or 60-day or maybe even a 90-day period before they would destruct, if you will. They would not, they would just, the, the fuse would turn into salt water and, and it was no longer a mine. But they wouldn't tell me how long the fuses were because they said, you don't need to know that. If you get shot down, you don't need to tell the Vietnamese how long your mines were. The other area we mined was down south, near the, the border between North and South Vietnam. There was another harbor. And we would drop them just off the coast. And the ships were in port. The ships were heavily lit up because they were foreign ships. They didn't want us to hit them. We were not allowed to attack those ships. They were just stuck in port. And until the war was over, they just anchored there. So it was, that was our basic mission, was to fly around there. We tried to expedite things towards the end of the war because the war was coming to an end. We didn't know that. We didn't know when we were going home. We would ask. We'd been there for five months, and they say, it's time for us to go home. And they said, well, we'll tell you when it's time for you to go home. So we really didn't know when we were going home until the last minute when they said, you're going home. And we all hurried and got ready to wrap it up and go home. So that was my experience in North Vietnam. Most of the time I was flying over the Delta, most of the time night missions, occasionally a day mission. I'll be glad to answer any questions you had about that or about the war. Again, it was mainly controlled by Washington, D.C. We're not, we were not free to bomb Hanoi, the capital at all. That was strictly off limits. Haiphong itself, the city of Haiphong was off limits. The only thing we struck in any cities or towns like Vinh south of, in South Vietnam were the harbor facilities. We did not, we were not looking for civilians. We were not bombing towns as a general rule. Main reason I was doing my low level missions at night was to f avoid the towns. My radar would show the towns up perfectly and I could fly around the, the towns and my navigator would navigate me and we'd be coming up on a town and he'd say, turn right to go around this town. Well, I would turn left and go around the town, and he would sit right beside me, and he would give me one of these, and I had a sore shoulder after a while. <laughs> because I always went to the left because the town was on his side. And he was, I say, you observe the 4th of July, because as we fly by the town, it would look like the 4th of July. But we would avoid the towns, we would navigate to our target, get rid of our bombs, and fly back to the ship. Over to you, sir. Okay. Okay. As I said before, my name is Skip. There, I was uh, working on the flight deck on the USS Midway for uh, for two cruises to Vietnam. One was a nine-month cruise. Uh, we came back after nine months there, and we were working up to 18 hours a day every day while we were out there. Our main job was to get our knights in shiny armor, these guys right here, up safely into the air and return them safely to our deck again. 
uh, uh, part of our jobs was take care of that deck. Get all the uh, aircraft refueled, get them all armed, get them all ready for them. So that was our main job, receiving this uh, uh, ammo and receiving the petroleums on board the ship there and having the ship ready and getting their aircraft serviced so they can get up there and do the jobs of the night. We really appreciate you guys. And uh, <clears throat> it was pretty tough there. A couple times there we had a couple bad this times. And one of the worst times there is after we come back uh, from Vietnam. At the time, the uh, communities back in the United States, they were kind of get to the point they were anti-war. We were at war for quite a while. The American people were not used to that. We were used to getting in there, no more than a war, maybe two years, three years and such there. But we were there for quite some time. And we would come back there to San Francisco, which was our home port, and we were really looked down on. We were really uh, cut down, and, and a couple times I was even spit on. After I lost about five of my men one time, come back pretty well, beaten up, and we're actually downgraded and spit on. But today, I see the, uh, the enthusiasm with the American people that when we go into some place there, they thank us for being veterans now, which are really pleased for that. But uh, the first cruise, we were over there for nine months. We came back to the United States. We are only here for about a month. We are carrier calling new squadrons and such like this. Then we got a word that the Kitty Hawk was broke down or something. We had to turn right around and go right back over to Vietnam for 11 more months. So we're actually almost gone for just about two years. We're very close to that. And uh, it was quite some time, 18 hours a day. It was pretty rough, but I think we served our country pretty well. What can I say? Anything more? Skip on I appreciate what you did because I got to spend more time with my girlfriend at the time. Oh, <laughs> very important. I'm so glad you got to have your priorities. Okay. Okay. Here you go, mate. Thank you. Wow, I have a different story to tell. Uh, I was boots on the ground. I was Army. Uh, I saw Vietnam every day, 24 hours a day. We had 24-hour shifts. We did our job during the, during the daylight, and then at night, if we didn't do an ambush, we would be on guard. An hour sleep, rotating sleeping pattern. This lasted for a little over 11 months, almost, almost a year. That was a tour of duty for the Army, it was uh, a year, 12 months. 13 months for Marines on the ground. I was in the Central Highlands. It was primarily mountains and valleys tall mountains, low valleys, and uh, uh, you might not know that the Ho Chi Minh Trail is not a trail. It is many, many trails. And there's many arteries that would, as they came down, then they would come into the country itself. And we were there trying to get rid of the new troops, and we did a pretty good job of it many, many times. A lot of times we didn't see them, but we knew where they were. We had sensors. Um, but like I say, the Army's job was never, never done in a 24-hour cycle. It was, it was all day. And uh, I, I was an old man when I got drafted. I, actually, I'd worked for the Navy as a civilian before I went in, and then they, they drafted me. And uh, so I was 21 when I got drafted, and I was 23 in Vietnam when I got when I returned. Um, an old man grew up fast, and uh, and I don't regret it at all. I had to take questions now if anybody's got it. Yeah. Anybody have any? Yes, sir. 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 Y
Yes, ma'am. My question is for Dick, and I remember you mentioned um, the Dick Clark no one asked, Yeah, no one asked me if I liked the war. I was trained and I did what I was told. So my question is, how did it make you feel not being able to contribute your thoughts and um, to be, in a way, deceived, to be told that your attacks were effective when later you found out that they weren't? Does everybody understand the question? Any, any question on that? Basically, again, I was trained to fight a war. And I was assigned to go over there with the squadron. That was not my choice. I was, I was with that squadron. I was going to go wherever they went. So I really did not have, nobody asked me my opinion, but they wouldn't have asked me, if you will, because the chain of command was so far above my level that we did what we were told and what we were trained to do. And so basically I just felt I was doing what I was trained to do. I was defending our country's interests. Uh, I knew that there were targets that I thought were a better way to, to maybe finish the war and, and end it, but that was uh, way over my head. So I basically did what I was told. So I, I had no qualms about what I was doing. I didn't worry about the fact that it wasn't being done right. There was nobody I could talk to. I could talk to my skipper, but he had nobody to talk to. So we were basically there doing what we were doing. Chuck, have you got anything to add to that or any, any thoughts on yeah. uh, I'm being raised in a small town of New England, and we are in the shadow of World War II when we grew up. Um, so if you extrapolate that out 10 years to 1955 through let's say 64, um, everybody, that, everybody that you knew as a parent or an elder in town had served in some form of the military or had done something in a civilian capacity to, for the World War II effort. And my motivation to joining the military was twofold. One is we had a draft, had to do something. Uh, the other is that I just felt an obligation at 21 years old, graduating from college, to do something like they had done. And I thought, well, you've had this great childhood, you've been safe your entire life, maybe you need to contribute something to the country. So, similar to this gentleman, um, when you got over there, it wasn't a question of, of questioning tactics or anything, you, you had this belief that some higher authority really had the big picture. Well, they didn't, but, but we were not all that smart, um, which probably was, a, was a, a fortunate thing. Um, I think as you had more time there, second cruise or whatever, you started to understand that we were kind of games in a pawn at that point. We were, we were kind of the pawn players or, or part of the, uh, the players in a, on, a, on a chess deal, and they were trying to negotiate the peace, and they would use us all over the military to apply pressure, and then we could go back to the go back to the go back to the go back to the negotiating table. So many times, all of us were put in harm's way, uh, not necessarily to prosecute the war, but to make a statement so we could go back to Paris, where this thing was being negotiated, and apply some pressure. It was not uncommon to go into a target area that was highly defended, knock the defenses down over a three or four day period, and then start to bomb the rail lines and all, and then they'd pull us out and we'd come back a month later and go through the same drill again. So you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that you're kind of being used and abused as far as, as, far as getting hung out. I will say, uh, and we do like to call ourselves, the aviators like to call ourselves the rock stars, like Skip said, but you gotta understand that naval aviation in particular, we had a certain skill. We could fly on and off the ship. And, uh, and we have to pay tribute, I think, every day to the people that were on the ground. Because as the gentleman at the end said, they were on the ground 24 hours a day. And they had to have eyes, eyes in the back of their head. We were in combat 90 minutes a day. And then when we flew out to the ship, which was 80 miles off the coast, we were back in the United States. Couldn't have been any safer. Uh, the United States was 6,000 miles away, but essentially that's where we were. So I was always in awe of the people that were on the ground in harm's way all the time. 
And I was thankful I was able to get that skill. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Any questions? Have any of you ever gone back to Vietnam just to visit, or do you guys not think of that? I thought at the time when I was there, when I was over on the mountaintop, and look at the beauty of Vietnam. I always said I want, I'd like to go back, but I don't now. I, I meet a lot of people from there, and I'm glad they're doing well. And I have friends that have gone there, but I want to go where I want to go. And they kind of dictate where you're going, where you're going to go. I mean, I've seen a lot of that country, not as much as these guys, but I've seen a lot of I'm up and down the trails, and and I like I said, it, it, it's a beautiful country, and I wish them well, but uh, I have no desire to go back. I have uh, a couple of close friends there from Vietnam, and they, uh, this one lady, and she went back there about six months ago. She says, well, in the cities, it's really starting to grow back up again. But still out in the country, they're still suffering quite a lot. Uh, with Agent Orange and such, such like that that we had to use during the war to, to take down the foliage and all. It's still affecting a lot of the population while they're over there. And their economy is not up there where it should be right now. But we'll give them some time. Uh, when we were over there, one, one thing that really amazed me is that uh, these people that we fought over in Vietnam, they also fought the French. They were highly skilled. So we really had quite a lot on, on our plate to really catch up with because the majority of our uh, military that we had, we were not as skilled and we haven't had the combat. You know, when we went in there originally in Vietnam. And eventually, we caught up and we surpassed them. But the very fact is that, what can I say? Okay. I have no particular desire to go back, but I got nieces and nephews that are not of our generation. They're follow-on generations. They have been back, and I've been told it's a very beautiful country, that the people are very supportive of Americans that come over there, and especially to North Vietnam. And uh, myself, I've just got other places I want to see, and I've been there, done that. I've seen the Philippines, I've seen Japan, I've seen Taiwan, I've seen enough. I, there's other places I still want to go, so I have no desire to go back. But I, if somebody wants to pay my way back, I won't, I won't turn it down. Um, I spent 11 years on active duty and another 16 in the reserves, and after that 11 year hitch, I was able to get an airline job, so I flew, flew to the airlines for 25 years. And I'm really, really sick of airplanes. <laughs> so I probably don't, I don't get on them for long periods of time because uh, you got to think about it. It's this aluminum cloud. It's 35,000 feet going 500 miles an hour. I don't know how it works. It's ridiculous. <laughs> don't do that. It's nuts. But it gets you from point A to point A. It does. That's so bad if you go first class. <laughs> That's right. Anyone else? I have a question. Sure. Um, sorry. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys had a chance to see the Ken Burns documentary, uh, Vietnam War, it was on, on PBS. I just want to know if you had seen it and what you thought about, you know, how it starts to educate uh, the younger generation about the conflict. I only saw the early portions of that series. And I was fascinated by it because I didn't know the French. I knew the French were involved. I knew about their problems. And we were briefed on the French and that whole evolution. But I didn't know about the early parts and, and uh, the, the goings on. The later parts of that series, uh, they're trying to bring out a lot of points that 
I don't disagree with, but it's what's, what they don't tell you that's missing that, that turned me off because they can only do so much in a series like that. So I have not really paid much attention to the later versions of the series. Um, yeah, I have not watched the series also. Uh, maybe it's because I've got my preconceived notions and I don't want them to be changed. <laughs> not that I'm close-minded or anything. Um, I, you know, uh, touching back on, on the, the treatment of the service members primarily enlisted that came back, and the, 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 the change in the American psyche with regard to blaming service members for a, uh, an unpopular war, I think, I think now we've got it right. Uh, and I'm not sure why we didn't get it right before. But when I would be interviewed by Time Magazine or Newsweek or whoever came aboard the ship and they would point blank ask, ask the aviators or ask anybody on the ship, um, do you feel this is a right war to fight? The answer was, we're on the tip of the spear and we're the operators and it's not our call. If you've got something that you want to address with regard to the prosecution of the war, whether we should be there or not, go talk to the people in Washington. Don't be talking to us. For some reason, the people on the tip of the spear seem to get blamed for the prosecution of that war, which is kind of odd. And all of a sudden now we've really got it right. And, and if you don't like the war, uh, honor the people that are up on the tip of the spear of prosecuting the war and go fix it back in the political circles where, where it all got started. Uh, so no, I, I haven't seen this series. Yeah, yeah I've seen uh, Part of it there. There's one part there where uh, 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 with the, the tent of offensive and such like this, that, uh, that Richard Nixon, the president we had at the time there, he really pushed for that. He pushed for that extremely hard, and I think that's one of the things that got him elected the second time. That was, that was, it is what got him elected. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, In our so politics, yeah. politics uh, sort of governs our wars and such like that. I'd say from the Korean War on, a lot of it is really uh, controlled by politics. And people in the upper ranks, and as we said, we're just the tip of the spear. And that's our job. Well, Nixon, well, uh, Nixon, his campaign promises, promise was that he had an answer to end the war. But after he got elected, his answer was, I was kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, I started watching that series. I watched the first three or four. Uh, episode four was a lot with my unit. Uh, it was quite involved. So it took me a while to do five through ten. In fact, I just saw the last two last week. And it's been out for a while. And, and it's a lot of that that's being told in that documentary is, uh, is a lot that we didn't know. There was no, I mean, we never got, when, when you're out in the bush, you don't get newspapers, you don't get, uh, you don't have uh, transistor radios. I don't know, you guys don't, don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had no contact with uh, the world. Um, and we would write a letter home and it would take, if, if they got it in a week, that was pretty quick. If you got an answer back in another week, that was pretty good. But a lot of, um, a lot of people, they, with, with the lack of communication, unlike today, it causes a lot of marriages and friendships and, and relationships to go south because you, you didn't have contact with the people back home. And that was a, that was a, a real major uh, throwback. We, we, got, we got the Stars and Stripes once in a while. That was a magazine or a newspaper? Newspaper, and it's still going today, and, and uh, we fight over it. And, uh, but uh, the news was very slow. 
in Vietnam. I thought, at, at least for us, it was. And we didn't have the, the pleasure of uh, the evening news or anything like that. Uh, but but I think it's a good series. It, it, uh, I hope that you all learn from it, uh, the, how politics are involved. But the uh, soldiers, the sailors, the Marines, hey, they're the best we got. Uh, hands down, but we just couldn't do it with the way we were led. All I can say is, we're your spear. We're the tip of your spear for you. That's the main thing. And I feel that we were, I think we still are. More so today. And in every cruise and in every combat situation, we don't all come back. And we've got good friends that didn't come back. So we do remember those people, especially. Donna? Donna. Okay, my question is two part. One, can you speak a little bit about your transition back into civilian life once you came back? And also, how has your experience over there informed who you are today? Either one or both of those. In my case, I came back from Vietnam and went back to flying airplanes. And uh, for the next four years after that, I was as an instructor at the Air Force Institute of Technology with the Air Force in a Navy uniform. I had no duties to do there except teach some students. And I, for four years, transitioned to that. So I was busy. I didn't have all of the post-war reaction from a college viewpoint, from students in college, I didn't see any of that. And I went from there right into a job here in San Diego and worked for 13 years for General Dynamics here in San Diego and then retired and have enjoyed retirement ever since. I've been retired over, for over 25 years now and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I recall coming back in November 72 after Basically, it was a ten and a half month cruise, and I was pretty proud of the way the ship had uh, done its thing. We had six carriers on the line at one point in 1972, so um, I was very chagrined that, that wearing my uniform in public was not to be done. It just was not going to get me was not going to get me the reaction that I had hoped for. So, surprisingly enough, you know, in early '73, wearing your uniform into the 7-Eleven to get a cup of coffee in the morning. Was not something that you really wanted to do. It's kind of weird, isn't it? When you, when you look back on it uh, now, and, I'm, and I have to emphasize, we're not jealous. Believe me, we're not jealous. We are, we are thrilled when we see a young soldier go into a restaurant with his wife and somebody pick up the tab. I think it's just great. Um, but it's it was it was a difficult transition, and you had to. The reaction usually was we ran out of the base and we stayed with our people. We were kind of insulated, um, and we couldn't really interact with the public. Um, interesting times, but once again, I think I think we've got it right now. After I came back from Vietnam, I got stationed up in Atsuki, Japan. I was outside the United States for most of my career in the Navy for about 20 years. Out of, out of my 23, I was outside the United States. But after that, I came back. I was aboard another ship. Then my last tour, because of my, my experience aboard the Midway and such like this, I was uh, learn, I was an instructor for uh, for pilot rescue <laughs> and uh, aircraft for firefighting as well as shipboard for firefighting before I did retire from the Navy. You know, my fuels experience after I got out of the Navy is going back to college to get a degree again. And I got a call from the Navy, hey, Chief, we're looking for you. So what? So I worked for the Navy for another 20 years out in Point Loma, and then I retired again. Now I'm just a volunteer on the Midway and also with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. So I kind of kept the military a little bit going through most of my life. You are in your fuel purple, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the color for the fuel guys on flight deck. With grapes. Yeah. Uh, ironically, I worked for the Navy as a civilian prior to getting drafted um, at North Island here in San Diego. 
So I was in a military job, and I thought at the time that I was uh, supporting the war cause. Uh, I did a lot of, uh, anyway, that went on their, on their aircraft, all the Navy and Marine aircraft. I got drafted at 21, and like I said, they changed my, uh, on my education and knowledge from uh, aviation, a mechanic to, um, they thought I was qualified as an infantry man. So I went, <laughs> I did two years uh, in the Army. Uh, as I said, I jumped out of airplanes because I worked on them before, so I know how they were. And then when I came back, I got my job back with the federal government. So it wasn't a bad transition because I was with veterans. You know, my community was a veteran, you know, a bunch of veterans. Although I was going to school for another four years, uh, be in the civilian uh, environment, but I had a pretty good support group coming back. But I wasn't right. I still wasn't right. I wasn't right for 20, 30 years. And I just started going to the VA a couple years ago. But they're getting me that they're getting me back to normalcy, I think, you know. Because you can see I have a I still have problems uh, when I think about the war. I have a question. We can start with you first. I have a question. Um, when, you, when, you, when you heard that you were coming back, was the first thing you wanted to do or the first thing you got to do that just kind of left an impression on you? Well, I, I was sitting in a, in a club, a listening club in, in a Air, Air Force Base. Uh, in Vietnam, and, and I saw a guy that walked in the country with me to, uh, 11 months earlier. So I asked him what's going on, and he says, uh, he says, First Sergeant says, if you don't get back to the base, you're not, uh, he's going to revoke your orders. I said, well, orders? I just got back from leave, you know, I'm on my way back to the unit. He says, no, you're going home. So it was like that, real quick. I didn't know I was coming home. So uh, the next day, I went and got my papers, and then found out that the captain was out in the field, so I had to go out in the field one more night, and, and that was the longest night of my my life. So then I came back, and uh, yeah, and within a week I was home, or well, I was up in uh, Washington State. But just a, a day or two before that, you know, we were I was in combat, and they leave, uh, then they let you go. And they tell you to go on unemployment for 90 days because we're qualified, because they said we're not ready to mingle. So, which worked out pretty good because my 30 day, or no, my 90 days of unemployment was about the same time I had to get my job back at North Island. So it was, uh, I did, I, mean, I think I did okay. It, it wasn't easy, but it was, a, you know, I got through it, you know, I guess in my way. And, and, and God bless the Navy, you know, when they came home, they came home board ships and they got their welcome that they deserved. Whereas the Army came back, you know, depending on when you went over, you were straggling, you know, you didn't come back as a unit, as a rule. So what they did to us, how they treated us, is the reason why, the uh, big reason, why, why the soldiers of today get a welcome home, because we won't let that happen to anyone else. You know, we want them to have a welcome home that we never got. I hope I answered your question. I don't really have a problem with that because the, the future people that are interested in the service, it is a good good service. I encourage them to stay and, and benefit from the uh, things the service officer offers. I encourage them to join the Navy. They won't be in a foxhole. Uh, and you're, and uh, talk about being aboard ship and, and having a three square meals a day. On the other hand, the Air Force has got many places uh, to see the world also. But uh, basically, I encourage them, if they come forward, if they don't, I say, hey, do what you want to do. 
We don't have a draft anymore. I was drafted, but I, 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 was, I had to register for the draft, but I was never drafted. I went to college, got involved in the Navy, so I never was drafted. But they did have a draft for me when I was 18 years old, and I did have to sign up for the draft, but they just weren't drafting people. But I was on the list to be drafted. But basically, I didn't have a problem uh, telling people that, hey, if you like it, it's a great way to, a great career, a great life. And if you don't, get in and get out. I've got nephews that joined the Marines and then injured themselves and couldn't go on deployment with the rest of their crew, and so they got out. And more power to them. That was their choice. And you do have those opportunities. You have any job? Well, back in the day, um, following World War II, he continued to have a draft. and Everybody had to serve two, two years. The only exception was if you're sitting in this room and going to college, you could get a student to firm it for four years, assuming your grades were up. Your grades mm -hmm. had to be submitted every semester. But at the end of that four-year period, there were no five-year graduates or six-year graduates. At the end of that four-year period, then you were subject to the draft or volunteer. I wish we had a draft today, I really do. And I don't mean it from a negative point of view, I mean it from the point of view is that if you think about Congress and you think about prosecuting wars, back in the 60s and 70s, most congressmen and most senators had children that were somewhere in the military. And today, and I don't know exactly what the stats are, but I'm happy to make them up, we probably don't have more than 10 U.S. representatives of the 400 plus that we have, or just a couple senators of the 100 senators we have that actually have children or nephews that are in or have served in the military. And I just don't think we have a representative buy-in. Um, if your parents knew that you were in the military, they would be probably much more interested in what's going on politically and make their thoughts known to their representatives and their senators, et cetera, et cetera. So we almost have a mercenary situation going on in this country now where 1% of the people in the country are serving in the military for a lot of good, for a lot of good reasons, GI Bill or whatever. Um, and some, some folks just feel that call, that call to duty. Um, I think that's great, but it just isn't representative and it doesn't have to be the military either. I think you could do public service for two years, give something back to the country in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I think would I think would make us a, a better country all, overall. Very few of our representatives and congressmen have military service behind them. Some have some charity services, if you will, or some obligation along their way, but very few of them. The only one that comes to my mind is John McCain, because he was a classmate of the year before me. He wasn't my classmate, but uh, I, don't, I can't name too many congressmen that have any military service. It's kind of funny. I was in the Navy for eight years, and I received my draft notice. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I went down to personnel with my draft notice, and they laughed, and they threw it in the trash can. I think they still might be looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got guys out in the bush when we got the, uh, when we finally would get mail, uh, got the draft notices, so it's not a perfect system. <laughs> but uh, I, I do too, I agree, I think we, we should still have the draft. Just give the younger kids that don't know what they, what they want yet, it gives them a little growing up time. Uh, I, I got, uh, I don't know how, I got a one, one year deferment for education. And so the next time I went up to Los Angeles on that 6 a.m. bus from downtown San Diego, I, uh, I went up uh, two or three times. And then uh, that last time I knew I wasn't coming home. But if they were going to, you know, like today, you're, the question was, do, uh, yeah, I, w I would say go in. I tell them, if you want adventure, go Army, go Airborne. Because uh, it's an awakening. You do more things before 8 o'clock that most people don't do. <laughs> and your day's almost over. But uh, yeah, I, I, I would. I, uh, they have great uh, education systems. You can make a career out of it, or what you learn, make a career out of it. But yeah, I would encourage them to go in. As 
one thing there I, I noticed in the armed forces today there, just about every role that the armed forces have got, with the exception of uh, Navy SEALs and such, are divided up with both sexes now. And I think if they do bring down the draft again there, I think it should be for all people, not just the, us guys. And because the experience and the training that we received there, I think a lot of women will love the same training there and the ability and the experience that we received. So, let you know. Okay? Well, yeah, I was working on aircraft carriers when, I, when they trans, uh, when they started having women aboard ships, you know, uh, and ca the carriers being one of the last ones. And you, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a tough job on that flight deck. And these guys can tell you. And I worked, uh, you know, I did a lot of work on aircraft carriers. So, and I ended up doing 40 years of federal service up for the Navy, but my military time was Army. And I couldn't have had it better. And the USS Ronald Reagan is very proud of the fact, and they make it as part of their story, they had a 100% female flight crew on the flight deck. And that's, a, that's an accomplishment because there's a lot of more senior people, but I don't know if the flight deck officer was a female or not, but she might have been in today's uh, environment. So we do have 15 to 20 percent females on our aircraft carriers today, and they are doing a super job. Anybody else? Any other questions? Thank you guys for coming today. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you guys.